My name is Isabel Alcoff. I'll be conducting an interview with Rita Geibel. The date is May 13th, 1997. We're in Chicora, Pennsylvania, uh, United States. The interview will be conducted in English. Good morning, and thank you for agreeing to do this interview today. Uh, you are a liberator of World War II, and it's a special treat for us to be able to come to your home. Can you tell us your full name at birth, please? Rita M. Geibel. My birth was March 27, 1921. And what was your maiden name, please? Strobel. Okay. And where were you born? I was born in Butler, Pennsylvania. All right. Can you tell us a little bit about your family, your parents? I had uh, two brothers and three sisters that was born in Butler. Uh, the oldest, my oldest brother died here a few years ago. Uh, the only one that's living right now is my younger sister and myself. I had a, a brother that was killed in World War II. He was with the Ski Mountain Infantry in Italy. Um, my older sister is deceased, so there's just the uh, two of us now. My brother died a number of years ago. Tell too. me your siblings' names, please. My children's names? The yeah. siblings, your uh, brothers and sisters. Their names? was uh, Vincent Strobel, Rosemary Strobel, uh, Rita M. Strobel, uh, Margaret Strobel, and uh, Jimmy Strobel. Okay, and what were your parents' full names? My father was Anthony George Strobel. My mother was Mary Ellen uh, Darkety, married to the Strobel. Can you tell me a little bit about your father? He was a wonderful man. My father was a contractor. He worked very hard. He built his home, which is natural stone, like the home we have now. He even dug the basement out with a wheelbarrow well and a pick and shovel. He lived to be 92 years old. He loved to fish. He used to take us fishing. We would walk 11 miles to go up to the Nida Dam in Butler County where we used to fish. My mother would pack our lunch, and he would uh, take us up, and before it got dark, we'd all walk home 11 miles to Butler. I used to go picking with them with blackberries. Sometimes we'd even go out to Saxonburg, Pennsylvania, which was about 10 miles from Butler. I remember when I was only about seven or eight years old, I picked that whole bucket full of blackberries, and we carried them home to Butler. And what did your father do for a living? He was a contractor. But during the war, or before the war, actually, uh, things got very bad. And uh, everything, he had to take his money. He had started, they were building a home, and he had it in the bank. He had to use it. So my mother and dad decided to break bread. And so they had uh, started a bakery in the house. And when we were home at school during the uh, afternoon or dinner time and that evening, and on Saturdays, we used to uh, sell the bread to individuals until he was able to go back to work to contracting. Tell me a little bit about your mother. My mother was Irish. She was a wonderful person. She had a lot of illnesses when she was young, but she was a, a very, very pretty person. And she was very good, and we had a lovely family. We really would work together, and we had just a lovely family. What was your education or background? My education, I uh, went to eighth, eighth grade at Catholic school at St. Paul's in Butler, Pennsylvania. From there, I went to the high school uh, in Butler, Pennsylvania, Butler High. And from there, I uh, went to a defense school in Pittsburgh, Brighton Park. And I studied sheet metal. I got my diploma there. I spent, uh, until we'd finished, we put in all ducts, like for furnaces and things like that. From there, they sent me down to Baltimore to study blueprinting. And uh, I was there two, two months studying blueprinting. And from there, they got me a job at GE and uh, I was making communication wires for the Navy when I decided I would like to go into the service. Okay, now you said they sent me to here and sent you to Baltimore. Who's they? The government. Okay, and why, how did you get involved with the well, government? Well, because uh, they, were, they had defense work, so I, mm -hmm. I, when I was younger, before I went into this, I used to, from the time I was 12 years old, I worked for a doctor, he's one of our neighbors, and I used to, he had two children, and I used to go in and sit there and answer the phone for the doctor and get in contact with him when I was only 12 years old. And I actually earned all my money from that time until the time that uh, I was able to get out and get a job, you know, of any type. 
So f I, I had this opportunity when I graduated from school, and I went down to Pittsburgh, and I took this course. In fact, we had very little money even to get back and forth. Sometimes we even thumbed to get back and forth, but we would take a couple of us because we just didn't have the money to get back and forth. It was bad times, and you just didn't have. Tell me approximately what year this was. I graduated in 1941, so it was shortly after that, yes. Okay. Right, and what was your home like? Can you describe your home? We had a wonderful home. We had, uh, we lived in School Street when we were children, very, very young. It was on Institute Hill in Butler, Pennsylvania. And from there we moved out to East Brady Street where we had a larger home. And uh, from there then my father bought a lot and he built a natural stone home just up, it's on East Brady Street Extension too. We had a home there where we're, when I went into service we were living there in the house. And can you tell you, me about your family's religious background? We are Catholics. I was born and raised in the Catholic Church, and uh, I still go. And I, I was, as I said, I went to the Catholic school and uh, was educated there, and we still believe in the same religion. What was Butler like during the early 40s? Well, it was very bad. Times are very bad because, uh, because of the depression that we had. Uh, but we kept very busy. I used to be allowed to go to the playground, but we had to get our work done before we had, each one of us had chores to do, which we did. We went to the playground. I learned to play tennis. I learned to play volleyball. I learned softball. I learned to pitch horseshoes. In the first year that I played in Butler, with the city of Butler, I came in second place in tennis. We won many of the other championships in volleyball, and we competed in four different play, uh, play, playgrounds in Butler County. And uh, this was a thing that uh, gave us something to do, you know, and keep us busy. We always were doing something. Now, you were the middle child? I was a middle child, Okay. Yeah. Tell me just briefly uh, what your siblings were doing in the early 40s. Well, my brother started to work. He got to work at the Castle Rubber Company when he was very, very young. Mm -hmm. He had to. He had to get out. We had scarlet fever in the meantime at this time. I was just in the fifth grade, and we had scarlet fever. And uh, each one of us eventually uh, developed scarlet fever. One, maybe the quarantine was ready. In those days, they quarantined them. And they were ready to take the sign down. And uh, then I finally came down with it. And uh, so I only, when I was in fifth grade, I was only in school two months the whole year. So the sister uh, that I had, Dorothea, she said that she would uh, like me to repeat that year because I'd missed so much, which I did. But the reason they didn't let me out of quarantine, I have very dry skin, and my hands are still peeling. And finally, Dr. Purvis, who was our doctor, he said, you take that sign down out of the house or I'm going to come up and take it down. So it was, it was, we had the ordinary diseases that went around, you know. And it, uh, Would you say that you had a normal high school experience then? Yes, I was the second most athletic of our class. We were 365 in our class, which is very easy to remember. And uh, I participated in a, a lot of the activities that we had at, at, at the school. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, when did tell me? You were telling me all about your siblings a little bit. Uh, can you continue telling me about them? Well, my sister Margaret, she uh, is the one that's still living. Now she has uh, a boy and a girl, and uh, they're both living. She has grandchildren to them. Uh, she, her husband died. Uh, Oh, a number of years ago, I don't know the exact date, but she remarried again. She lives in Butler, Pennsylvania, and uh, she uh, she worked out at Castle Rubber Company. She worked in chemistry there for a while, and then she worked also out at the VA. She uh, worked uh, used to work in the pharmacist. She wasn't a pharmacist, but she was a helper in the pharmacist mm -hmm. at the VA in Butler. And your other siblings? Well, James, of course, was killed in the war, so we didn't. Uh, last time I uh, got in touch with him was when I, we were home. I had got a furlough uh, for a few for a week or so, and we happened to be home the same time. And that's the last time I ever saw him. But oh, I did get uh, we got letters from him. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was overseas, if that was on my birthday, uh, that I got word from my CO. She called me up and told her my brother was killed in, in uh, Italy. So I thought maybe that at that time that he would be home because he had been wounded in, in uh, January. And in fact, he got killed March 4th, 1945, which just two months the war was over. So it was very hard on the family. It was very hard on my father. My father almost had a nervous, nervous breakdown over it. It was terrible. They just, 
they didn't realize, and I thought maybe that he would be hung too. I thought he was, they would probably, you know, bring him back. They didn't do it. He went back to combat, and of course he was killed. Had he volunteered to join? Yes, he volunteered, and you know, I have a letter, it's been published in the paper here just a year ago, that he wrote to my niece, uh, my oldest brother, they were expecting their first baby. And when he was, it says somewhere in Italy, and he wrote this letter, and I have a copy of it where he said that, uh, in case I don't get back, I want you to know that you're going to be my favorite niece. And it was, he, he told all about it. He said yeah. that, and I think, we think at that time that he knew that he wasn't coming back. It just seems to sense it that he wasn't, wouldn't be back. Okay. So four of you survived, really, the war. Mm -hmm. okay. Any of the other siblings joined the military? No. Can you my tell brother, me? my oldest brother was deferred because they made gas masks. He was, uh, he worked at the rubber company, too, mm -hmm. and that, that's why he was deferred. Was your father ever in the military? No. What made you decide to join? My mother told me that when I was about six or seven years old, I told her that they was going to have a woman's army someday and I was going to join. And I, I, I never knew this, but she told me this. She said, you know, she said, you told me when I wanted to join, she didn't want me to join. She said she didn't think it was the right place for a person to go, but finally I convinced her and she let me go. Can you tell me a little bit about how this happened, exactly how you signed up, what kind of training you got? Well, when I was in Baltimore working, um, I used to see a lot of people come in the shores, you know, especially from overseas, the French uh, soldiers come in and the different ones, you know. And so I just, I had a angling that I wanted to go. I, I just, I just wanted to go. I had to go. So I went down to the Navy and I checked in about the waves and I thought well boy I better go home and talk to my parents because we always did this we always would go to our parents and, and ask them you know if this was all right or that so I went home and told my mother now she she was just against this so I tried to convince her <laughs> tried tried so finally she said well my dad said let her go she wants to go so I decided I was going to go into the army because I felt if if anybody would go overseas it would be the the Women's Army Auxiliary, which it was at that time. And so I thought that opportunity I would join, and that's what I did. So it was really because you were anxious to go overseas? Well, yes, I wanted to be part of the war, really. Why do you think that was? I don't know. See, my dad's youngest brother was in World War II, World War I, I take it back. Mm -hmm. He was gassed in France. And I sort of admire him. In fact, his, his uh, name is on a memorial in Butler on, on mm -hmm. Newcastle Street. And uh, I just kind of, I remember him when I was very young mm -hmm. and how he suffered. He had broke his back when he was out in a, he was in a mine in Colorado and, and he came here and his sister, my dad's sister, took care of him. And uh, I, I, just, I just sort of uh, admired him. Mm -hmm. And that's about the only military in my family that I had. Were any of your friends with you? Any? No. Yeah. Uh, so you know. went to Baltimore really by yourself? Well, no. When we went to Baltimore, yeah, I was the only one that went down there to Baltimore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was it like to arrive in Strange City? Well, I don't know. You get used to things. You know, things happen to you just to. One of the things that was very nice, uh, there were five of us that was working down there, and I didn't know these other girls, but I met them. And there was a... Um, a uh, Lutheran minister's home that we were able to board. We paid room and board, but we had five, there was five of us had different rooms in their home. And this way, uh, it would give us a place to stay mm -hmm. and to do what we wanted. But money didn't seem very much. I made real good money. I don't remember what it was, but then it was good money at that time. So it didn't mean anything to me. I just had it in me. I wanted to go, and I'd like to got into service. Okay. Now, describe your job when you were in Baltimore first. We made this heavy wire, communication wire, that was uh, rolled it on big rollers and so forth. I had a fellow help me. He helped, did all the lifting and, and like that there. But it just, uh, it was just community metal wire is what actually it was. Do you know when you signed up? To go into service? In the service? Um, actually, it was June 15, 43. That was the Women's Army Auxiliary. Mm -hmm. And what was going on with the war at the time? 
I don't remember much about what was going on. I couldn't tell you what was right. going on. Were you reading the newspapers? Were oh, you yes. listening to the radio? I, I, I listened to the radio, and I, I, we read a lot of newspaper items, yes. And what was your reaction to what was going on? Well, it was a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. It was something that uh, you just couldn't believe. We used to hear, when we were children, we used to hear about the coming in from Chicago, you know, the mafia and so forth. And then when this come along, it was just something that, that, that she was, it, it was just hard to believe what it was. And believe me, I never realized I was going to see and do the things I did. Mm -hmm. It was just amazing. Where did you go to sign up for the military? Where, did, Where did you go to sign up for the military? I went to Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And you know what? When I got down there, we was down all day long. And about 1 o'clock, 1.30, the doctors came in, the three doctors, and said that they'd turn me down. And I said, why? And they said, you have a heart condition. And I said, I don't have no heart condition. He said, yes, you do. I said, well, if I do, I said, you're the first to know it. So I was just about in tears. In fact, I was in tears by the time I got home because I was very tired. We'd been there since early in the morning. I took the bus and came up to Butler, and my brother met me there, my oldest brother. And so I told him, I come home, my mother was up, and she said, why are you so late? And I said, well, it took all this time. And I said, you know, they tell me that I have a heart condition. She said, who told you? And I said, the three doctors. I said, they got to go. She said, you don't have no heart condition. She said, I, the doctor never detected if you did. Next morning, she called Dr. Armstrong, who was a cardiologist in Butler, one of the best. So he made an appointment right away, and I went down. He examined me, and he said, how long were you down there? And I told him, early morning, late at night. And he said, you don't have no heart condition. He said, you were probably just tired. So he wrote a letter, and he gave me the letter. And I called them, and they said to come back down again. He sent a letter to them, too, but he gave me a letter, and I went down. When I went down, there was an officer. He got the biggest kick out of me coming back. And he said, Rita Geibel, and I said, yeah, Rita Strobel, I'm sorry. And he says, uh, you know what? He said, uh, if Dr. Armstrong said you don't have a heart condition, he said, we're going to take his word. And he said, you know, I'm a very good friend of your brother's. And I said, yeah, here was Major Mentier, <laughs> and he lived on First Street. We lived in mm -hmm. School Street, and he lived just the street office. I knew his sister, but I didn't know him, and he, he got the biggest kick out of that. He said, if you, if Dr. Armstrong says that you are all right, then he said, we'll let you go mm -hmm. in, and he never found a heart condition after that. So what happened next? Well, from there, I went to uh, Fort Little Fort, Georgia, for basic training. We were down there, I don't know how many weeks we were. We had cadre that would march, we had formations, we had parades, uh, we had schooling. We were schooling in uh, anything like that happened to us in mm -hmm. Blue Cross. We had all this type. We would have to uh, march, we had the obstacles we had to climb, we had to fall down in the uh, mud and the water, just like the boys, the same as the men did. The, same, uh, the very same thing we went through. Now, was that also in 1943, mm -hmm. still? Okay. Did you go with anyone that you knew, or were you alone? No, I was alone. Mm -hmm. uh, how did your mother react when you left? Well, um, I suppose she missed me. Her dad didn't. I, I missed my dad terribly. I was very, I don't know, I loved my mother, but my dad, we were very close. We had something in common, and we were very, very mm -hmm. close to one another, because he was, he was just a marvelous person. Every time he came home, he would have candy in his pocket for us, you know, and he just, he was a very caring. Mother was too, but we worried about her because she wasn't very well, and mm -hmm. it made it very hard. How long were you in Oglethorpe, Georgia? I don't know how long. I just took basic training, and then from there, I don't know the dates because I don't remember, and I don't have no record of it, but I do know from there that they sent me to photography school in Colorado to the uh, Larry Field. And I was scared because I had never as much, the only thing I ever seen in photography was a box camera, what they used to use. And so I went, uh, when we went to school there, they uh, taught us how to uh, develop film. Can I just interrupt a second and ask you, in Georgia, did they do some testing or to see what you were good at, or did, did they choose you uh, to by arbitrarily to send you for photography school? Well, they gave us tests, and I did make 100 in my mechanical ability, mm -hmm. and this is the reason why I was sent to photography school, so okay. they told us. They said if you have that ability because you have to work with your equipment that you'll be working on and your mm -hmm. cameras and so forth. Had and you ever worked with any machinery otherwise? No, no. 
nothing but except, of course, the sheet metal I did because mm -hmm. see, we made we bent, we made the the uh, furnace parts. See, and sheet metal's going to fence school. Mm -hmm. It actually, I would say, it did help me. But then I knew a lot of this before that because, as I said, I worked with my dad. I always was with him, and I would uh, help him put a nail in and do this mm -hmm. or that, you know. And I, I just use a saw and everything. My Lifetime dad. skills. Yeah. Okay, so you arrived at Lowry Field, and then what happened? Well, we went to photography school. We used to have parades, and um, Kimmel, you know, from uh, Pearl Harbor was there. He was commander, and uh, they sent him here after Pearl Harbor had happened, and uh, he made us sing in formation. That's the first time we ever would do that as we walked in formation. We went to school. Uh, we studied books about photography, and uh, from there then I was sent. After I graduated from there, I got a diploma from there. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, in photography as a photo lab technician, they call that a 945. From there, I went to Bowling Field, Washington, D.C. Okay. Excuse me, in Lowry Field, do you remember any of your instructors? No, I don't remember any of the names. Approx I guess. Approximately how long was your training there? I think it was, they cut it down. I'm not quite sure. It may have, it may have been 10 weeks or something like that mm -hmm. that they gave us. Now, were you with a group of girls there? Yes. There were there were any men getting this training also? Not at, well, not at our time, though. These were mostly girls that, that were in training. All right. And was there any particular part of Lowry Field training that you remember better? Or any unusual incidents or anything? Well, one of the things I used to, we used to sit and watch the planes come in, and I, I was quite fascinated. I always was fascinated by the plane, especially the P-38, the Black Widow we seen there. And uh, we would we would sit and watch them as they come in and land and take off. How and did you know how to identify the planes? We learn just by uh, talking to individuals and seeing them come in and, and back and forth. And, and it was uh, I I at one time had would love to have been a uh, air hostess, but uh, I my life was just not to be. So you went a different direction. It was yeah. a good one apparently. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, after your training at Lowry Field, you went on? I went uh, over to uh, Bowling Field, and uh, we did a lot of things there. We worked in the lab. Now, that's, we had aerial photographs, but they were, we made contact prints of them, and I think they were very important but because they were very high up. The, the uh, height of them was extremely high, and you couldn't hardly see anything. Uh, we took the wax off the floor with a razor blade. We polished the labs, the doors, and they just kept us busy. At this particular time, I stood on our guard with the other wax when President Roosevelt came to visit there. Uh, Yugoslavia, they were given uh, three planes. The United States was given three planes. And we were told at the time that the book that came out said that it was Yugoslavia that they were given these three planes to. Roosevelt came in his uh, limousine. I was quite surprised to see that he was so crippled. We didn't know at that mm -hmm. time that he was, they had to help him stand up in his limousine. And uh, the plane, the one plane flew over. Now we were told at that time that that was the first jet that we had and it was going 300 mile an hour. Now the stories don't conflict, but when this book came out from Bowling Field, it said that this is what it was. So mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't unusual for them. They never told us very much about things like that. They kind of kept it quiet. So you didn't get any further training at Bowling Field? No, just just we just the just fooling around. We were waiting to go, and then they asked us if we would write an essay if we wanted to go overseas. Hmm. I wrote one, but I don't know what I wrote because I don't believe I saved it. <laughs> so they said, well, then they told me that I was go home for two weeks. So I went home for two weeks, and uh, then I came back, and they sent me home for another week. And I said, well, I was just home for two weeks, and they said, well, you better take it because it's going to be a long time before you will be able to uh, see home again. So mm -hmm. then I knew it was happening. So from there, then, they sent us back down to Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, where we were in training there, and of course, they told us if we was captured and what we are supposed to do, and we weren't supposed to take a camera, we weren't supposed to take a notes. We went through all the different gases. We went through the uh, chamber where they had gases. We came out. Mm -hmm. There was one gas, and I'm not sure what it was, but we had to take our gas masks off and burn our eyes. The tears came down, and uh, we uh, they just 
actually talk to us what we should do if if anything that uh, happens to us if we'd be c uh, if somebody would capture us and that that was about the extent of it mm -hmm. i don't know how long we were down there i do we know do you know when you left Oglethorpe? No, I don't mm -hmm. know when I left. And from there, I went up to Camp Shank, New York. And uh, this is where if we were going overseas. We knew that. We were in quarantine. And I believe we stayed up there about two weeks. And uh, we were not allowed to uh, leave or get on leave or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But the strange part about it and it was, uh, I believe it was in May sometime that we, uh, I believe it was in May, uh, that we were to board this ship, and when we got down, we were the, the women were the first, last ones to be put on. We had about three thousand young officers that were going over for the invasion, and uh, the some of the officers came down, and they had a lot of the girls from the office, you know, was with them, mm -hmm. came down and said goodbye. And we thought this was very strange. That why were they allowed to do that? Because they were going back into New York. They were from New York. And why were they allowed to do that? Because they could carry their stories back. In fact, one of the girls got word that her mother, there was a message left that her mother's in the hospital and she's dying of cancer, and they, she wanted to go home and they wouldn't pull her from the, from the convoy. She had to stay there. Mm -hmm. So we loaded at uh, about 1.30 in the morning when they finally got us on. So you were on a ship with men? Yes. Did you have contact with any of the soldiers? No. Well, we did when we had what's called dry run. We had to go to the upstairs of the ship, you know. We had what's called dry run in case of being attacked. When we were at Camp Shank, we did practice abandoned ship. We had a uh, ship there that had a boat, small boat in, and we had a, a rope mm -hmm. ladder that we had to climb down and come back up. We had to do this a lot so we could, you know, if we ever had to abandon, we'd know how to do it. But when we went on this ship, we had we were just packed in almost like sardines. They had uh, hammocks, and the, the smell of the oil from the ship was uh, uh, just terrible, just awful with heat, you know, because mm -hmm. we were down in there. When you got up, as you had a dry run to make, you got up on the top deck while it was uh, very cool. The air was cool, and it was different. you know the name of the ship? I think it was the... Um, Aquitania, they call it. We called it the South American Cattle Boat, is what we called it. I don't know why, but that's the name. We always give a name for something, so we call it the Cattle Boat. Okay. It's about getting on the ship, the Aquitania. Can you tell us a little bit about the trip, the voyage over? Yes. Uh, the very night, that night, I had volunteered to stand guard. They, we had certain places we had stand guard, and we had the post, and I think that so some of the men wouldn't come in our area, you know. We had so many we had to stand guard. So I volunteered, but I never made it because I got so sick. <laughs> I couldn't keep anything down. So I was sick probably in the in in our manic where hammock where we were. And the next day then they had to take me down to the hospital because I just couldn't keep anything down. So I actually spent the whole way over on the hospital. But about the seventh day we were out, there was a uh, when I was in the uh, hospital on board ship, there was a terrible explosion. And uh, I said to the doctor, I said, what was that? And he said, I don't know. He said, I'll find out. And uh, so he came back and he said, uh, that was a U-boat firing on the freighter to the right of us. And so and then a little bit, there was another explosion. And I said, what was that? And he said, well, just wait a minute. He said, I'll and he said they sunk the U-boat. So from there we went up to Gurok, Scotland and we went in by a small boat. When we got in by a small boat, uh, just as we was ready to land, the Red Cross was meeting us there and uh, we had run out of food and uh, so they had candy and uh, cigarettes. You ran out of food we on board ship? On board ship, yes. They, they ran out of food. They didn't have so they had K-rations for us that they handed out. So there was an explosion up on the hill. We could see the uh, smoke and stuff from it. And we asked him what was that, and she said, don't you know? And we said, what? And she said, that's Hitler's V-1 bombs. It's welcome you. Well, we'd never heard of the bomb. There's no way we ever knowed about it. Mm -hmm. So from there, they put us on a train, and we went down to London then. And from that very day, till the end of the war, night and day, there was V-1s and V-rock, V-2 rockets all the time. When did you arrive in Scotland, do you know? 
I'm not sure of the date, no, when we ran it. See, we, had, we weren't even allowed to keep notes at that time. Was so. it beginning of 44, the end of 44? It was probably in 44, I would say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you arrived in London and there was bombing? Oh, yes. There was uh, the V1s and V2s. And uh, so from there, then, we took a train and went out to High Wycombe, which was uh, Eighth Air Force Command. So we went by um, train there to High Wycombe. We got off at the station. We paraded into the field. We had to walk from there to the field where it was. It was quite a distance, but we walked in formation. There were a lot of people. Newspapers greeted us, people. We got there. We were the first battalion to go there. There was 400 of us that had settled in there that came in at uh, different times. Do you remember the number of the battalion? They just called it 8th Air Force Command. And what was your rank at the time? I was, well, when I graduated from uh, uh, photography school, I was PFC. So uh, by the time I got to Washington, D.C., they took it from me because they didn't have, <laughs> they could only have so many uh, ratings because they only had so much money. Mm -hmm. So then when I was working in the lab, I got my PFC rating back again after I was in there. So, uh, so you were a PFC when you arrived in England? Yes, ma'am. Now, you said you were parading. Was this strictly the Women's Army Unit? Or? It was a Women's Army Auxiliary at that. Well, it was a Women's Army Corps because when we were in Fort Worth, Fort Georgia, we were sworn into the Women's Army before I went overseas. So we were the Women's Army then. So this was history when we came. There was 400 of us that came to headquarters. We were the first battalion of women to settle in, in the 8th Air Force Command. What happened to the men that were on that continuum with you? They went to the different divisions. Some of them were very young, but they went, there was over, I think there was over a hundred bases of it. Mm -hmm. uh, Barry St. Edmunds, there were a tremendous amount of the division. Some of them uh, we eventually got up to see. We played sports in some of them, and we did get up to see some of the divisions where the planes would take off and come in for their missions. Right. Now, when you arrived in London and with your battalion, how long did you stay there? We came straight out to camp from there to where our camp was. We got on another train at Patton Station and took the train. And it was, uh, it was about 20, 20 miles, 25 miles out of London. And we came out there and we marched clear up. And it was, there was a very, very large hill mm -hmm. where we had Neeson huts that we were assigned to. And ours was named Penelope as well. We gave, each one of us gave our names to our huts. Okay. And how long did you live in those huts? Lived the whole time we was there. Our men from the lab lived in tents, and it was very mm -hmm. hard because, you know, it rained all the time. I can remember it rained 30 days, 60 days at one time. We mm -hmm. used to wade in mud, wet. Uh, in the huts, we had a, a, a pot belly stove. Half the time we had nothing to fire. There was no paper wood to start a fire. Occasionally we'd get some, uh, uh, some coal they'd dump outside and we'd be able to start a fire. Uh, we lived in these huts, there were 13 of us. Now, the 13 girls that was in our huts, they didn't all work in the lab. There were four of us that were there that we kept very close, even to the night. We stuck very close together. We worked together. The two of us worked in the model printer, and the other worked in contact printing. And Can you tell me their names? Yes. Uh, uh, Harriet Parker, she married a, uh, uh, oh, I can't think of his name now. Harry Harriet Parker worked in the photographic land, and Betty Lohler, L-O-H-L-E-R, she died in uh, 1958, we got word. Betty Cushing was uh, in contact printing. Uh, Betty Decker, she's married to Wolford. She lives in uh, Strutters, Ohio. She's not very well now. Uh, she was with me in the uh, Malta printer section. Now, when you were living in these huts, um, were you working during the day, or was there any task assigned to you? Well, we had to get up at 6 o'clock every morning. We had to go out and do PT. Eventually, our uh, commander of the lab, he said that he didn't want us to do that because he felt that we were working long hours and it was too much for us, so they cut that out. We could sleep a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. We'd work very long hours, sometimes 12, 14. Some of the fellows worked 24 hours. Uh, even sometimes 17 hours. If we had orders to get out, we had to get those orders. They were very important, so it had to be done. Uh, the reason they uh, got the girls at that time, you know, at first we were kind of criticized and laughed upon, but they found out that uh, just like in our multi printer section, 
where uh, as we put out two million prints a month and uh, this is coded in our book it's the book of the made up will tell you that this is true some people don't believe that's a lot of prints we had six multi printer machines which worked 24 hours a day we worked seven days a week sometimes we would get Sunday off we did it, but uh, most of the times we we had to do it because it had to be done Right now you were strictly developing the film at the time? We were developing film at the time. Our first assignment was developing this roll of film. This roll of film would be about nine and a half, nine to nine and a half wide. And it would be about uh, 200 feet, maybe 300 feet. They'd come in a big canister. They were marked. And when the film came from the reconnaissance, it would fly it back to us. We would go in. The first job that we had, we had to go into the dark room behind the processing machine that, that developed this film. We had to do this in complete darkness, which we had never did. We were scared to death because, you know, if you made a mistake and if you ruined that film in any way, that those reconnaissance would have to go back and that may, may meant the life of them that they would never return. So we uh, was very successful. One time when we was working there, there was a splice that came back, which they said was not unusual. It broke. See, this would come out into the chemicals into their developer, into your fixer, and then into your hypo at that time, we call it. And it, it, uh, when it went into the wash, it had a chemical with alcohol in it. Well, the alcohol caught on fire, and uh, there was no way we would have gotten out because there was no door exit or anything like that because mm -hmm. we would have had to come right alongside the, the printer or the developer as it right. came out in from the room. Whenever we got it through the uh, hypo, we were able to put a yellow light on and we mm. could see what we did. Sometimes we'd get shocked on machines because they were electric. We used all uh, English, the model printers were developed by the English. That was the uh, type that uh, we did these with. Now after the pictures were developed, where did they go? They went to the different divisions. This goes through the machine and then somebody would cut them on the end and they'd be piled up. And of course they were in rotation, the annotation on them. It showed the dates and the flights and the heights that they were going, and then the, the group, they would go to food intelligence, and for them, they would be sent out to the different divisions, and it was also sent to the Allies, to countries like Belgium and France, because they were all involved in it, too. Now, did you actually have contact with these reconnaissance pilots at all? No, the only pilot I ever know, I know the cameraman, uh, he worked with us. He had uh, dropped a, a camera out of a, a B-17 <laughs> when he <laughs> was. Okay. But that, that's the only, only thing. I, I've, uh, I had a cousin that was a, uh, he was from Butler, Richard Siver, he's still living. Uh, he was a, uh, a radio operator on the uh, B-17, the B-24, I'll take that mm -hmm. back. He was with the B-24 group. Now, uh, was was there still about 400 women doing this? Or? No, the other women were all different fields. Uh, some was. Now, we have a woman from Pittsburgh, by the way, that uh, was uh, Mary Gill Rice. Uh, her sister lives in Brentwood in Pittsburgh, and she mm -hmm. was General Doolittle's secretary for years. She was highly uh, educated, and uh, she was picked because of her, uh, her uh, typing. Mm -hmm. you know, and a, a shorthand that she had. She's a marvelous person. I met her. She lives in Marietta, Georgia. Uh, she's been at our reunion, and uh, she worked for him all through. Uh, uh, the generals all wanted, but General Doolittle happened to get her. And uh, she, uh, even he was her best man when she was married, and she worked with him, and uh, Doolittle worked at Shell Oil Company when he came out of service, so she was his... She was his, uh, he was, her, he stood for her when she was married, but her husband died a number of years ago. Tell me, at this base where you were located in England, were there any other people whose names we might recognize? Well, you know, when I uh, come to think about when we were in basic training, we were told that Woolworths, there was a Woolworths girl who had a Woolworths store, and they said that she was one of the millionaires. Now, she was in basic training. I just remember when you said that, and you know what? She uh, she used to get the girls to go to the store and get things. She always had money. She liked to eat candy. Mm -hmm. Whatever happened mm -hmm. to her, I don't know. But they said she was one of the heirs of, the, of Woolworths, so mm -hmm. it must have been true. Anybody else whose name we'd recognize? <coughs> Not at this time. I yeah. How long did you stay there? In England? Mm -hmm. Well, 
we stayed till the end of the war. We worked on, on the photographs every day. And occasionally we did get into London. I think mm -hmm. once we got in on a three day pass. What did you do in London? Well, one, th one time when we was in London, uh, we had a girl from uh, Long Island, and her aunt lived in London, so we went to visit her. And uh, we took off her uniforms and put civilian coats on <laughs> and come down to Padding Station because we were tired of using uniforms. After we thought later that was a stupid thing they did because we had our dog tags on. We used to take a camera and take pictures, and uh, there was one time when I was in there, I took pictures of the bombed out area, and some woman went and called the Bobby, which is a policeman, and he said, you arrest her, she's a spy. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I had my uniform on, though, that day, <laughs> though. And so he took me, well, he said, come on, we'll walk up to the station, and he said, uh, I, I had my papers, I showed them to him, and he said, uh, he said, there's no problem. He said, she's, you know, he said, you can't blame her because they've been among all these bombs here and this building was bombed out, but he said the reason that she uh, was concerned because underneath that bomb they had a, a factory they were working at down there, and he said, and this is what he told me, mm -hmm. although I, we didn't know it because it was no way of us knowing. Mm -hmm. So he took us up to stations and then we went ahead and did what we wanted to do, but we would go around and, and visit, and uh, we visited her, her aunt there. And if we had rations, sometimes we'd bring them in and, and mm -hmm. buy coffee or something was sent at home, we'd take them there. But there was very little even to eat in London, even if you did have, you didn't have, you didn't have much food. Food was very scarce. Did you have close friendships with all the girls that you were living with? And oh, yes. Uh, when you lived together for around almost, what, a year and a half or something like that, they, they mm -hmm. yes, you had very close relationship with them. We, uh, we worked together, we all did, even, even the men. When we had, we had 13 girls in the lab, now there were some other ones to the other part. And some went to the second floor to tech, which was the same group that we mm -hmm. command. But uh, the, uh, the guys would uh, tell us about things at home. They would be worried about this and that. And they would always ask us, you know, what, what would we do if you did that? But we were very, very close with every one of them. We were friends. I never dated real m very much because my mother was very strict and she said be very careful because you don't know whether you don't want to get hurt and it could be possibly some of these could be married and you didn't know that so I just was kind of hesitant mm -hmm. another thing we were so tired when we were through working that we we would just have to go home because we had work to do too when we got back you know we had to do our hose and stuff and keep our hair nice and things like that were you allowed to bring any personal possessions with you no uh, they, we, we, I don't know whatever happened. I believe they sent them back after we got to the mm -hmm. camp. No, there was no, not, uh, not back. Well, you mean back or when I went over? When you went to England? No, uh -uh. everything person? we had to turn in. Yes, we, we, we just we got all all new issues. Everything when we went into basic training. And how did you keep in touch with your family at the time? We were able to write. We had email that we sent, and we could write. First of all, we were quarantined for a while before we were. We were able to write. Mm -hmm. They coin to you every time you move into a new section, you know, in case you're getting sick or something like that. Mm -hmm. We came from um, Colorado to Washington, D.C. in a train. I got terrible sick. Mm -hmm. And uh, the doctor, I had a temperature 102, and he put me in a private room when I got down to Washington, D.C. And uh, he said, you might come down with nothing. And I said, no, it's just being sick. I said, I've always did that. I had, when I was a little girl, I had turned my left ear drum over. Mm -hmm. And coming home, a black doctor told me on a small liberty ship, he said, you know what's causing that? And I said, what? And he said, what would you do to your ear? And I told him, and he said, that's why you, uh, he said, your equilibrium mm -hmm. is disturbed from the motion. Mm -hmm. So that's the only time that I ever had anybody ever tell me what caused me to do that. Because mm -hmm. when I was very little after this happened, I couldn't swing on a swing or anything like that. Tell me what you were hearing from your parents. Well, they just hoped that we were all right, is everything all right, and that they were fine. And they used to say, Mother's all right, we worried about her being sick. And uh, they would talk about Jimmy being in Italy. And uh, of course, after he died, it was, uh, it was a just different story. You wanted to be home. It was mm -hmm. very hard when you were away, when you were away with strangers and your brother died. Yeah. In fact, my CO said that when she came, uh, she called me up. She said it was one of the hardest things she ever had to yeah. do, and she said it was the only thing in our group that that she had to do that too. But uh, I felt uh, very lonely then because mm -hmm. I, but I, I have learned through my training 
you keep busy, and this is exactly what we did. We went to work, we kept busy, we kept talking about other things and things like that. Once you were over there, was it ever an option to drop out, quit? No, I don't believe so. I don't know. There was never no one that I know that dropped out. There was one girl that went out of her mind during one of the V1 attacks, the bomb. She used to, when the V bombs would come over, like the sirens would go off. Sometimes we'd just maybe go into bed or something like that. Of course, we had them in the day, too, even at the lab. They would drop near the lab, you know. But uh, she would shake something terrible, and uh, we thought at first she was putting it on. Now, she mm -hmm. worked in the telephone in the underground, and uh, we thought she was just putting that on. And here, uh, this one night when the uh, sirens went off, it was rather late at night. And sometimes we would work the 3 to 11 shift, too, see. So it was after that we came home, the sirens went off, and she went berserk. She went completely out of her mind. So we had to contact the the uh, headquarters there. And uh, see, we stayed with the WAC detachment, but we were assigned to the reconnaissance, mm -hmm. to the 8th Air Force photo lab. But our orders came from down there, but uh, they uh, they sent somebody down the street, Jack, and put her in. And then I, I just when I talked to my CO recently, she said here that they took her up to Oxford, England, was a hospital mm -hmm. there, and she said whatever happened to her, she never knew. But mm -hmm. she said they probably sent her home. Whether she came out of it, we never heard from that up to then. So. What was the American military telling you about what was going on in Europe? They didn't tell us too much what was going on. We, uh, in fact, we, we uh, they didn't even tell us where we were going when we left. We mm -hmm. had no idea, because we knew that we were going from New York, we were probably going to Europe. But we didn't know some uh, some of the girls did go to Africa, and uh, so we we just we were just they didn't tell us anything at all really. But mm -hmm. In other words, they kept everything very very secret. Mike, did you have radios? We had a intercom in our hut, and uh, they had music, the American broadcast. In fact, Hitler it was Hitler's voice, and whether it was him or not used to come on. And mm -hmm. they know our code code name was Pine Tree. Mm -hmm. And Hitler said, Pine Tay, you're next with the V1 bombs. And then, of course, the VTs. He used to interrupt the programs, you know. They would interrupt the programs and come on with that. And, of course, we just made jokes, you know, and made fun of it because mm -hmm. we didn't take it. Sometimes we were so tired that we didn't care <laughs> whether he was going to send them or not because you just you just got so tired. You know, when you worked in the unheated building and you had chemicals smelling all the time, uh, you were cold, you never was able to get warm. We even used our overcoat when we mm -hmm. worked in the lab. We had a wool overcoat, which is an ugly thing, and uh, we had the slacks. We were the first girls to wear the slacks, and uh, we would bundle up real good and drink coffee all the time. Mm -hmm. They had coffee for us, and so we drank black coffee. Good old American coffee. Yeah. Did you have sugar? No. No. That was uh, rare. I understand every place to have sugar. No, we didn't have we, we, there were lots of things we didn't have even in our mess hall, but we were supposed to serve mostly the same things. We had uh, butterscotch pudding. I can't stand orange marmalade. <laughs> it's one thing my husband can't eat it. But uh, orange marmalade was just terrible. Mm. Just uh, I'm not fussy about eating, but if you was hungry enough, you would eat. And uh, when we were bowling field, one of the things we used to do, if we had 35 cents, we could go to the little store there and buy a... Uh, mm -hmm. They bacon, lettuce, tomato sandwich on toast, and that was great. Mm -hmm. So you'd be real hungry, you know, and you'd be in. Overseas, we couldn't do that. But one time we did a, uh, we used to do, uh, uh, for the people that worked with us, we would do, uh, develop their film and stuff like some of the ones that had film, and some of the officers would develop their film and print it. We could do that on our, on our time. Mm -hmm. So one of the cooks got us a chicken one night, and he gave us a, some Crisco in a can, mm. and we got the fire started, and that night we cut that chicken up and put it in the can, and we cooked it, and it was about 11.30 before the thing was cooked, and everybody in the neighborhood could smell the chicken, <laughs> and they said, I bet that's those photo lab girls, because they get everything, but that's what it was, and boy, that, that really tasted good, and we was able to cook that, but that was... Did you know anything about what was going on in Japan at the time? No. 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 And did you know anything about the military units on the ground? We would get some of the papers, Stars and Stripes, and those people, the mm -hmm. papers like that. We would hear from that, and then we would at the lab. They would tell us when our when our uh, films come in, where they were from, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And they would tell us when we'd be printing them up, and they'd come over to us and talk to us and say where. But these were the people that worked in the office there. That the sergeant, Sergeant Dupree, he's deceased mm -hmm. now. He was head of the lab there. Did you ever? 
see or develop photos of concentration camps? In Germany. I was with 9th Air Force at that time. And that was it with the 9th Air Force. And, uh, we, we had flew into Schweinfurt. No, but this is what I'm asking when you were oh, in it, England. No, did not you, when I was in England. No. You never saw no, any never reconnaissance? Saw no. no. Of we never heard of any at that time. Okay. Now, uh, how did you know toward the end that it was going to be over, the, over, the war? Well, we we knew when the invasion was going to be, and of course we felt then that the, the war was going to be over pretty soon. And uh, it wasn't shortly after that it was over. But when the war was over, I was in London, believe it or not. I, uh, mm -hmm. The girls got leave. We went in for the, the weekend or the time it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had no idea that it was going to be over, but we knew because we knew that uh, about our work how much work we were doing and how much was flowing through the lab that there was something that was up and we kept saying we knew that it was coming the, the war was going to end soon was there an increase in the lab work um, no it was a decrease in it decrease. actually yeah but we uh, as we went in london and the war and we were in celebration in london and don't ask me where i was i don't even know i was on the street it was the most marvelous thing you've ever seen i never seen so many people mm -hmm. up the flagpoles or the poles lights and the lights were turned on which you know the whole time was over there we were in complete darkness and that was that was it was horrible because even when we come up from the lab at night the four of us always come together we had to walk off almost two miles up to the to the to our bed to our, mm -hmm. that's where we stayed and it was in complete darkness you weren't even like light, light a cigarette or anything like mm -hmm. that when you were out so okay. when were you officially notified of the war's end well, actually, uh, when we were in uh, we were in London, we were, it was a time that we knew it was a dead end because they all screamed and hollered yeah. the war was over, and they were singing, and everybody was hugging and kissing yeah. everybody. So it was just the men had to stay there. They bought kegs of beers in for them, and they they had uh, I have some pictures of it where they had a celebration. Of course, we come back, they told us about, it, but they wanted to go, but they didn't let the men go because they thought it was too dangerous for them to go. And so they, some of them, I, I imagine maybe some from the head of the command did get to go because we had almost 3,000 people there and all, and the whole command there. Mm -hmm. Did you presume at that point that everyone was going to go home? Yes, because we didn't know until they came up with this point system. <laughs> so tell me what happened then. Well, uh, we decided uh, we wanted to leave and we hadn't had any leave and uh, we wanted to get down to Bournemouth on the coast so the uh, lab made well, before that, uh, they did uh, ask us if we would like to fly over the war zone in B-17. Of course, I was thrilled to death that we was able to do this. So they, we got on B-17, and they took us all over the war zone. It was three hours over and three hours back. And we flew, oh, probably about 500 feet all over and seen the Sigford line where the mm -hmm. terrible cement blocks were built, you know. But they didn't stop our trip. But we went all over, over into Holland and then Berlin mm -hmm. and all over and seen the destruction, which was just horrible. Was this voluntary? Or we you volunteered for it, yes. They took us. How many times did you go? Just this one time. They mm -hmm. took us all over. And I came back. I was sick in the dog. <laughs> I think one of the reasons, because guys give us oxygen, and I think they gave me too much oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, did you take a camera with you? We had a, uh, a camera. This, uh, girl that was with us had her camera. We did pictures out of the, uh, where the guns used to be. We, we shot pictures out of it, and I have them in my collection, mm -hmm. too. This girl's deceased now. She died just two months after we were, the first we had seen her was Wichita, and uh, I don't remember what date that was, but two months later she, mm -hmm. she died suddenly, and then her husband died about two months after that. Okay, now you mentioned that you went to Germany. When did you go to Germany? Mm -hmm. As soon as uh, as soon as we uh, we went we got a leave to go to Bournemouth on the coast and we got down they set a place a beautiful place for us to stay right on the ocean we got down there that night we had our duffel bags we set them in the hallway and we got something to eat and we went out for a walk along the the ocean there and came back went to bed and we said well we won't unpack until morning and next morning at eight o'clock we got a phone call that we were to. Uh, come back right away because we were going to, going to Germany. See, we were really getting ready. We were going to get ready to go to Okinawa uh, because of the other war wasn't uh, over there. And uh, so then they changed their minds on that and they took us to Germany. What was the date? 
Mm, let me see. I have to think about that. I'm not sure of the date on that. Was it after the war's end? It was after the war's end. Yeah. So it was that would be that would be in. Um, it's probably in May, the last, probably the second week in May. 1945. Yeah, 1945, yeah. It had to be that, yeah. Okay. 1945, yeah. Um, Ms. Skybel, you were telling us that you went to Germany right after the war ended. Can you describe the trip, how you got there, how you got... What? Well, we flew in a C-53, and we landed at Schweinfurt. And Schweinfurt was a ball bearing plant. It was when I, I, um, they made... Uh, parts for planes and so forth, and also uh, submarines, was, we were told. And uh, when we went in to Schweinfurt, they had to land on a metal corrugated runway, and the pilot had never landed on a runway like this. So he almost crash landed, and we had to go back up, and we had to get back down the second time. The second time, we almost hit a house coming down. So when we got down then, we got out, and we all in the pilot kissed the ground. Schweinfurt, by the way, we, 8th Air Force, on two missions, lost 600 men at Schweinfurt. It was a very devastating, one of the most that we had lost in a, in a, in a good, good many during the war. So from there, they put us on what they call a weapon carrier. It would be a big uh, pickup truck with a canvas on, and we were sitting in the bank, back of it. Approxim and approximately how many people were with you? Well, And was uh, it all female? It was all female, but I don't know how many there were. The 13 of us was there from our lab, but whether there was anybody else, I, I don't remember. Because some of them, I found out later, didn't come. But we were the ones that, we, as I said, we stuck together pretty much. But we were mm -hmm. sitting in the back, and as we came out this uh, street, go back, go to our hotel, there was a Strobel Street, S-T-R-O-B-E-L, which was my maiden name. And they called me Stinky because I came from Pennsylvania. We have nicknames. <laughs> One girl was Betty Lawler. She came from both Pittsburgh, and she was smoky because she come from the city. So anyways, they hollered, hey, Stinky, look, they named the street after you. We went around a bend in this truck, and there was a German woman standing there, and she had a bush on her head, and she was had a long skirt, and she spit at us when we come by. So from there, we were taken to a beautiful hotel called Bad Kissinger, and we were stationed there for our headquarters, and I was assigned to the 13th photo group with Ninth Air Force there, which we uh, did. Uh, they said we did the work in case of, uh, of World War III. We, d we did the Mediterranean. I think it was just to keep us busy so that we uh, would have something to do, you know, instead of our time. Therefore, we were able to get uh, leaves. Mm -hmm. uh, several times uh, we were going to down to Nice, and uh, we went out, and of course we used airplanes, and uh, it seems one day the weather wasn't right, the next day they had a mechanical problem, and it went on like that till I got disgusted, and I said I wasn't going, so I stayed at the hotel. And uh, when the kids did go down there, one of the engines caught on fire over the Alps, but fortunately they got it out, and they did return. They, they, they went to Nice and then was brought back too, but I just decided I was going to spend my time at the hotel. So. Did you have contact with civilians? Yes, I had contact with civilians several times. Uh, we, by the waste, was in a compound. We were guarded all around this compound. Mm -hmm. We had all different personnel there. Uh, we weren't allowed uh, to leave the base unless we had someone with us. We had to take somebody. They had to take it. Like, we'd go to the town, uh, we to church. We had to have two fellows go with rifles to mm -hmm. escort her to Spain forth. They were always at the gate, and there was always somebody there was to her. Mm -hmm. We got up to uh, one of the uh, nurseries where they had grown gladiolus. The gladiolus in Germany were just beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we would take our cashins, cash or our rations and that we got from home, and we would trade them for the flowers so we could bring them back for the hotel. I talked to a woman that was in this greenhouse, and um, I asked her um, about the war, and she said, well, she said that her sons was in the war, but she said, you know, it was like you people. She spoke very good English. She said uh, we had to send them guard to war. If we didn't, then they would be put in prison, and she said it was probably like it was you. Uh, she she talked. We just talked just things like that, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, she she. I don't know whether she 
was feeling bad because they lost the war. Naturally, they did. They were very mm -hmm. bitter about it. I seen the sugar beets they had there in the ground, which were huge, and I never, I had never seen food in Germany at all. There was no stores. Mm -hmm. There was absolutely nothing that you could go and buy. You just, they just didn't have any until they opened an ice cream stand for us there, and we used to get it. We had got a ticket, and I think twice a week we were allowed ice cream, but you just didn't, uh, you just didn't see anything in the line of food. Mm. So aside from the, the hotel and the area where you were staying, did you get out in the area at all, or did you? Well, when we, we, we decided to uh, go up to, uh, we got a permit, got a Jeep, and we wanted to go up to Birch's Garden, and there was a WAC officer and another girl and myself. We decided we wanted to go up to see Hitler's home in mm -hmm. Birch's Garden. And uh, so we got in this Jeep and started this morning, and uh, we traveled, I don't know how many hours, we traveled on the Autobahn, which they had, the Germans had at that time. Seemed a lot of bombed out, you know, there were places mm -hmm. roads bombed out. And so it got almost dark, and um, so we was just about out of gas. In fact, it was a good thing we stopped there because just about a hundred feet beyond, somebody had changed the uh, detours where we would have dropped down on a hundred foot ravine. We were very fortunate this didn't happen. But this black uh, black camp, the fellows came out to us and asked what we were doing there, and they said, "Don't you know it's dangerous being in this jeep?" He said, mm -hmm. "He said, you know, he said there's a lot of snipers out there." And well, we didn't seem to think too much of it, so they filled our jeep up with gasoline and he asked us where we were going. And we said we were going to Birch's Garden because we had heard that Hitler had a gold elevator. We wanted to see that gold elevator. So he says, well, I advise you not to go. He said, because there's snow and there's still snow in the mountains there mm -hmm. in the Alps. And he said, not only that, he said, there's snipers in the woods. And he said, I don't think it's very safe for you. But he said, why don't you go see Dachau? And we asked him, he said, what was Dachau? And he said, well, that's where a lot of people were put to death. So we headed for the WAC detachment, which we were headed at Munich, and so we got there, and then the next morning, why, they told us where to go. And okay, now was this still, your entire unit was together going? No, this was just the three of us. Okay. This is a WAC officer and this uh, girl and I. Do you remember who was with you? Yeah, I think, uh, I think the officer, I'm not sure of this, I think Kingsbury was, Virginia Kingsbury was mm -hmm. her name. Uh, uh, the girl was, uh, she was from Dayton, Ohio, but uh, we kept, um, she came to visit me here and we kept close contact, but I think she's deceased because I got letters mm -hmm. back and, uh, oh, I can't think of her name offhand. She was, she was, she was, uh, you know, she played softball with mm -hmm. us too. But see, I, when I, we, we weren't, we didn't know them too long when I got I got involved with these two because they both was in sports with me, and that's how I happened to be involved. And they asked me to go along with them, and that's how I happened to get there. When you asked what was Dachau, how did they explain it? Did you know anything about concentration camps? No. We never heard anything about concentration camps or anybody ever put them to death. We knew our boys were prisoners of war. I'd even seen them when I was down in Georgia in Fort Overthorpe. They had mm -hmm. camped down there. We'd seen the German prisoners incarcerated. But I, I never, I never heard of anything like that. Never in our, and we did get a lot of news. We had a lot more news, but the news that we even heard, we weren't even leaving our photo lab. We weren't allowed to tell them in mm -hmm. our, on our hut where those, what we were doing. We were supposed yeah. to be quiet about it. All right. Can you tell me what happened then? Well, when they filled up, when we got down, we started out that morning and got down to the camp, and all of a sudden we could smell something sweet. It just was a, a different kind of a smell, and it was sort of a sweet smell like. It seemed as the closer we got to the camp, the worse it got. And it was just unbearable to smell. It was just awful. It was about five miles before we got to the camp. When we got into that camp, there was a Polish fellow who was a prisoner of war there. And there was just the three of us, and there was a, a colonel who joined us. And uh, this Polish fellow took us through the camp, mm -hmm. and he showed us. He took us over to these huge dog pens. They were real huge dog pens, there were two of them. There was a chair outside of each one of those. Uh, they had the German police dogs were in these pens. And when they had a prisoner and they wanted information, they asked if they wouldn't give them the uh, information they wanted, then they would feed them to the dogs. Mm -hmm. 
and they had killed the dogs. The dogs weren't there, but they killed the dogs. So as we walked back through, there some of those bones still laying in the grass as we walked back through. And we came down to this place. He took us down to where there was the furnaces where the bones is in the furnaces there. And they took us in there and showed us that there. And the smell, it was just awful. In fact, when this, when we walked in, I, I don't know how, to, we were very quiet among ourselves. All, all four of us was very quiet among ourselves. And we would take a hanky and kind of hold it up to our nose and our mouth because you just, just felt like it hit you with a bolt of lightning mm -hmm. when you was witness what you seen. We come out of there and then they took us into the gas chamber where they had the, you could see the things on the ceiling where they round where they had used gas. Mm -hmm. Some people say today they didn't use gas. Well, we were told they did. But when they, armies moved in there, they said there were 200 bodies in this building. They had removed the bodies from that building and some of them on the top were still alive. They were still moving. But they had declothed them and taken everything from them. And on the walls, there were blood stains, there were marks. Now, how they did it, I don't know. We often thought it may have been fingernails or something. They tried to write messages. There were some in languages that we didn't understand. We stood there. You just wanted to vomit. It was just terrible. And we came out of there, and we went down to another building. And in this building, they had these red flower pots. There was no lids on them. And the whole place was just covered with the bones where they had grinded them up and made them into fertilizer. I found out that the uh, Polish fellows did tell us that they did fertilize their fields there, and they were, you know, the groves mm -hmm. would grow, and they did, they probably, the sugar beets, I imagine, probably were fertilized with it, too. Mm -hmm. But they were still, this was all still in there. And so then we came up to a section where they had this gray big stone, and they had a brown rope, and up high it was cut off. And uh, every time I see a brown rope today, it reminds me of that hanging, that they'd hang them and shoot them. They'd just, if it was Germans or if it was Jews or if it was Gypsy, mostly Germans were put to death. But even some of their own German people were put to death there. Mm -hmm. They were shot. Blood was all over the ground there and all over the stone. So from there we came back and then he showed us this, uh, where they had the officers and the men incarcerated. And we stood there very close to where they were and uh, we were told to get the same rations we were getting. Mm -hmm. The officers wore their uniforms. I think their buttons were taken off of them. Their buttons were loose on their coat. But uh, they just looked at us when we were there, and we stood there, and there was a colonel with us, and I don't know who he was, and he turned around, and he had tears come down his face, and he said, girls, you're going to go back to America, and people aren't going to believe what you've seen here today. And this is what another thing I forgot when I was talking to these black guys at the camp. He said, Eisenhower said that he would like some of the personnel to see this camp because mm -hmm. he said if they don't see it, he said people aren't going to believe us, mm -hmm. and this was true. So tell me, when you approached the camp, you were in a car or we were in a jeep. You were in a jeep. When we got to the okay. camp, did you have to go through gates or fences or anything to get I there? I don't. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. I just. I what I remember is when I was standing inside that. When yes, I chamber. went standing inside, mm -hmm. yeah. It was when I was standing right in when the, we, we gathered there and we talked to this Polish fellow because he, I said, well, you look pretty healthy. And he said, well, I think he was six months or something like that. He said he was a prisoner. Mm -hmm. He said he eat grass for one thing. He said it wasn't. He said that he eat grass, but he, he looked to me like he was uh, not, you know, like you'd think he would look, but of course he said he wasn't in there that long. Was there any vegetation in the camp? Not that I noticed, no. Mm -hmm. I don't okay. remember. I don't just remember. I was in such shock, I think, that it just... Uh, and what else did you see there? That's, that's about it. Did you see any graves? Did you see... No. Did you see any German officers? Yeah, uh, German officers was in with the men, yeah. Yeah, there was German officers. And what were they doing? He was, they were smoking cigarettes, the ones that I seen. Just walking around in the, in the uh, behind the fence that they were incarcerated in, yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was a break time. I don't know. Or maybe they had them out because we were in there. I don't mm -hmm. know. They didn't say. All right. When you came, did you have any trouble getting into the camp? Or no. Uh -uh. No. Mm. All right. It was almost as if you were expected, or was it normal? I think or, so. Or well, I think that they were. I, I don't. Uh, you know, it, it just. I don't know. It just was one of those things that you just walked in upon. But I never dreamed. 
I never dreamed if they could do this to people. What did they tell you was really going on there? At the camp? Mm -hmm. Well, they said about the ones that were put to death, there were uh, 30,000 put to death is what they said. There was experiments used in there. He didn't go into detail, but he said there was a lot of experiments done in to the patients mm -hmm. that they were, that their patients, their prisoners that they were. Uh, the children also, I believe there was 80 children that were put to death at Dachau, is what they were told. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Were there any women at Dachau? Oh, yes, they had women in camp at Dachau. Yeah. There were women put to death there at Dachau. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, what else did you learn about Dachau when you were there? How long did you stay? I don't even remember that. Mm -hmm. But I remember that all the way back, we thought about that. We just couldn't keep it, you couldn't keep it out of your mind. You just constantly kept thinking about it. Right. Did you have a camera with you when you went? No, uh -uh. No, we didn't take pictures when we went in there. The pictures that I have was with the Ninth Air Force when the signal cord did. They were the pictures that we have. Mm -hmm. How did you get those pictures? Well, when I came back then, we, uh, we developed a film for them and the uh, thing that they, we had the film developed and then we printed the pictures that we had in the lab with them. Back in the England, you mean? No, in Germany. In Germany. in Germany, yeah. Right, so you were developing pictures mm -hmm. in Germany as oh, well? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Where did the yeah. equipment come from? Well, they, they came from the Ninth Air Force. It was all code equipment. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether they used any German equipment or not. I have no idea what they used. We had some of the most modern equipment they had to shoot for processing films and enlarging and so forth. Right. What, uh, after the war was over, and you were still in Germany. How long did you stay in Germany? I stayed there, I believe, till November. Oh, wait a minute. I don't remember the dates. I know I did get into uh, Camp Dix, or Fort Dix, New Jersey, on November 27th of 45. But uh, see, we, when we left Germany, we came with a German train, and it was the slowest mm -hmm. thing. And I don't remember how long it took us to come, but it took us an awful long time. We had to sit up in it. It was very slow because they said one of the reasons because of the bombing of the uh, train yards or the mm -hmm. marshalling yards they call them. And they sent us to a lucky strike in La Harve to a camp and that was horrible there. It was very cold, it was raining, it was mud, we waded mud up to our thing. We had mm -hmm. eight canteen of water a day. Mm -hmm. That was for everything, for drink and everything. And we had nothing to keep us warm. We had one blanket on a bed, a warm blanket, and we had pen knives, and we turned around and took slitters of wood off the, the ceiling, the two befores, and tried to start a little fire to keep warm. We spent mm -hmm. two weeks there, and then we were put on a small Liberty ship, which was in December, and it took us 13 days to come back. And uh, coming back, of course, I was in the sick me the whole time. They fed me Coke. They fed me uh, pickles. <laughs> they, uh, and this black doctor tended me and he was Mars, but I couldn't keep a thing down. I, I just, but we, the water was terrible. In December in the Atlantic Ocean, it is terrible. Mm -hmm. And when you have uh, only three, you know, you were three, sh th a small liberty ship, the women Marriott was, it would just roll back and forth. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so we uh, landed in New York, and we seen the Statue of Liberty, which we were thrilled to death. And the first thing they had for us was great big steaks, and <laughs> ketchup, and things on the table, and I couldn't eat a thing. <laughs> I, did. Okay. I uh, had a shower because, see, we had salt water going over and coming back. If you, if you wanted to shower, you had to shower in salt water. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they had to put me in the hospital for a couple of days because I'd lost so much weight. And uh, so, But I couldn't eat, but the steak looked delicious. But my main thing was wanted, I wanted to get back home and we had a hot dog shop in Butler which had everything on mm -hmm. <laughs> And I wanted to go to that hot dog and get a hot dog. <laughs> so that's, this is what I wanted to eat. But Did you find at one point or another that you were more homesick than any other? Or Sometimes we would, around the holidays, and I forgot about that too when we were in England, uh, on Christmas in 44. Uh, we had a uh, we had a hundred orphans came out to the base, mm -hmm. and we had them for dinner for turkey dinner, and then we brought them. We decorated our huts, and we won the first prize. And we had these children come around and see it, and then visitors were allowed to come into our huts and look at them and look at the. They were decorated beautiful. We we put pink stars or pink paint on the ceiling and put stars on just everything we wanted. And of course, being in the lab, we were able to get things that other kids couldn't get. 
And we had these hundred orphans. We made popcorn for them and passed it out to the helmets. Where were the orphans from? The orphans were the children of the War of England, and uh, they were orphans that had no parents. So we seen a lot of orphans when we were in Germany, too. The Red Cross had them there. And uh, we never actually come in contact, but we used, they used to take them out walking, and we used to see them when they would mm -hmm. be outside the gates. But anyways, uh, in England, these kids, they, they, they had no home. I understand that there was something like 500 children were sent over to the United States to live with relatives during the war and kind of mm -hmm. the V1s and V2 bombs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's another thing I never talked much about when we were in England about the V1s and V2s. Uh, at V1, when it came over, it was like an outdoor motorboat, you know. It would be a sound like an outdoor motorboat. And then if it went over your head, you, we knew it wasn't coming down. But if this engine set off, then we knew it was going to hit in our area somewhere. The V2s, there was never no, uh, they, they didn't, uh, the sirens would go off. Mm -hmm. You didn't hear anything. It just exploded. They carried the same amount of, of demolition explosive on them, the V1s and the V2s, that they did. But they would destroy almost a whole block or two whenever they would go. And they, that, would, that was really horrible. And, of course, that led to our going to the moon and our rockets, you know, was those bombs is what they used it. Did you feel victorious? When we won? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. But I was very sad because my brother wasn't able to come back. And I felt bad about this the prisoners that were, were, that were killed in, those, in that camp there. And then we found out there were so many other camps. And I just couldn't understand it, why we didn't know that, why we couldn't have been in there and, and knocked those installations out. Mm -hmm. Of course, then we would destroy people, too. This, this is probably some of the reasons that they... I mm -hmm. guess there was a bomb one time that hit near there because they had um, prisoners on it, or they had people, Jewish people, most of them, on it. And when that bomb hit that on the tracks, they left them lay there. Mm -hmm. I also... Uh, another thing that I had heard that, that there was over... One of the things that Dachau, all the hair from the women, now they made that into mattresses. They had over a hundred car loads of hair that was taken into Dachau and made into mattresses and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I guess some of the, the skin was another thing that they did. They skin, if you had tattooed your skin, they used that for lampshades. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was other things that they made. Now, I was asked uh, by CNN, one of the photographers down there, they, they did some uh, filming on a reunion, you know. And he had called me up one time from my room and asked me if I ever heard of a uh, little statue, porcelain statue. It's very small mm -hmm. and had an A on the bottom of it. If I ever ran across that or picked anything like that up, I said, no, I never heard of it. And I said, A sounds like Auschwitz. It may have come from Auschwitz. He said, no, he said his colonel had one. He broke it, and it, f it fell into a thousand pieces. But I believe that he was more interested in my photographic book. He wanted me mm -hmm. to leave it with him, and I told him no, that I wouldn't give it to him because I only had one, and I wouldn't give it out to nobody. Cause Did you have any contact with Jews after the, who after survivors? the war? Right. No, well, yes, when I was in, uh, when we was in, uh, at a wedding, uh, a number of years ago, in, down in the, uh, Kensington, Maryland. Sid's my uh, husband's brother's girl was married, and we went down. And he said to us uh, that night, we were going out for a walk, and he said, Rita, he said, I want you to meet my dentist. Mm -hmm. He said, he was a prisoner of Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want you to talk to him and tell him about your pictures. So that night when we went out for a walk, his home was right near where they lived. So I met him and his wife, and we talked for a little bit. But we didn't talk. I just told him what, what I was there at that mm -hmm. time. But so anyways, then he said, now he says, tomorrow at the wedding, he said, you tell him. He said, tell him about the pictures you have and about you being up there. So mm -hmm. at the wedding, when I got a hold of him, I, I did. I pulled him aside and started talking to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was so glad that I talked to him. And when I was talking to him, he uh, broke out in perspiration. His sweat just came down to his face. Mm -hmm. And he showed me his arm where he was tattooed. And he said, you know, he said, Mrs. Geibel, he said, I was a prisoner for five years in Auschwitz. She said, I lost my entire family. And he said, you know, my 19-year-old son, don't believe that this ever happened to me. And he said, I'd like you to do me a favor. He said, I'd like you to go out, he said, and show those pictures to these children. The children is what he said. And he said, tell them what you saw there. And he mm -hmm. said, maybe they'll believe you. And it took all these years, and just mm -hmm. the last, since I almost, since the 50th anniversary, 
that people really wanted to see those pictures. I showed my pictures, but I usually didn't show them because mm -hmm. people didn't want to see them, but some people didn't believe it. Okay, um, let's go back to when you arrived in New York and tell me what happened then. You mean when I came back from the mm -hmm. ship? Well, we were, uh, from there we just went, after there we were sent down to uh, Fort Dix for debarkation. Mm -hmm. Each one went on her way, and we separated then. I ran into a, uh, a who was, she was, her mother was related to our family. Uh, this girl had, uh, was with Patton's Army. She was a nurse, and she was in France with Patton's Army. So I, she was being discharged there, so we came home on a train together. We, I, of course, I've left the other girls because they all went in different mm -hmm. directions, but uh, she had stayed with my grandmother when uh, we were children in order mm -hmm. to go to school. They lived in the country, and one was a school teacher, and this other was a nurse, so she was with Patton's Army. She used to talk a lot, and she's deceased now, but she talked about the hardship they had mm -hmm. when they was in France during the war and uh, how they treated the patients. She talked to us about they run out of, that was the strange thing, that they run out of uh, uh, patches uh, for in medicine for the wounded, mm -hmm. and in England after the war, they found that all the warehouse was completely full of this material that could have been used. And she talked about this. Mm -hmm. So from Fort Dix, you went back to Butler. From Fort Dix, I went to Butler. Yeah, Were you discharged. discharged? I was discharged on December fifth, nineteen forty-five. Okay, what did the army do for you? After that, they didn't tell me anything. I was service connected because I developed high blood pressure and I was in the service. I did not know this. The American Red Cross did tell me at Fort Dix, they say, you know, you're a service connected veteran. I didn't know what the word meant. In fact, I could have been on pension at that time and never knew it. In fact, I tried to get back in the Army again and they turned me down because I'd had high blood pressure when I was in the service. So, and when I mentioned it a number of years ago here to the DAV in Pittsburgh, at the Federal Building in Pittsburgh, I mentioned that. He said, that's your fault for not applying. I said, look, women were never in the service like this. This is the first time that we made history. I said, that we didn't know that. I didn't know what a service connected. I didn't even know what the number was. I had the number, but didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. And I didn't use it until I think it was almost, I think it was somewhere in, in 73 or something like that. I happened to be down in Pittsburgh to the federal building for a examination and the doctor said to me, he said, you know what? He said, you should have been service connected. In fact, when they refused to take you, and I even had a letter, I even given to the DAV that it showed them I was refusal, but I never got compensated. I should have been paid clear back to, to, to the one I was discharged. But uh, he, I was put on 10% disability then. Mm -hmm. And another thing oh, I forgot to mention that when I was in the photo working in the labs for long hours, uh, one night we was at a movie, and I got a, a terrible headache and just severe pain in my head, and uh, so I went on sick call mm -hmm. the next morning, and I was hospitalized. And this is when I developed high blood pressure. Another thing, uh, my eyes went bad, and they had to get my glasses. So mm -hmm. they wanted to send me home, and I didn't want to go, and they needed me real bad. And I said, no, I just can't leave. And I said, he said, do you think you'll be all right? And I said, yes. Yeah. So they let me stay, and I, I, uh, went, I would have never went through all this if I had not stayed in there. So I was able to, uh, to continue, you know, my work that I had with them. But I don't think that they uh, personally, I don't, I don't think the women get, even today, I have been disabled since 1981. I had a stroke in 87. And um, I get 40% disability. They pay for my uh, uh, life insurance. I get a, uh, a small pension for that. But I had to quit my job, which I was working. I was making about $8,000 a year, and I had to quit my job. And uh, it wasn't allowed to work from then on. I never got compensated for that. So. Okay, uh, we were at the point where you were discharged from the Army and returning home. Uh, overall, you were making some comments about how the Army treated their women. Do you want to mm -hmm. tell us more about that? Well, when we was in the service, we had good treatment among the personnel, but it seems that when we came out, even today, they don't recognize the women. And there was 17,000 of us served overseas during World mm -hmm. War II. Uh, there was probably 50,000 or uh, over the, the entire uh, area, you know, that served. But uh, we don't get the, we don't get the, no, or, but we, we don't get anything to pleasure or, or notice about what we did. Mm -hmm. Did you get any recognition officially? I get a lot of recognition in this area, a tremendous amount. No, I'm talking officially from the Army. 
Now, well, I, I did from, I have letters I got in a newspaper that I have. I have a clip in here I can show you later on from uh, um, Bradley, General Bradley. Mm -hmm. I had a letter in the paper and praised me for my work being with the photo group, mentions my name and mm -hmm. intelligence and in the work I did. I got one from Arnold. I got one from Elliot Roosevelt. I got one from General Doolittle. In fact, General Doolittle used to send me a Christmas card, he and his wife, up to the time he died. I have those in my album. And uh, I, uh, I don't know who else, uh, Eisenhower. I have a letter from Eisenhower for our work. We did get a tremendous amount of letters like that that I have in my collection. What happened when you got home? Well, it was a different world. I wanted to go back. <laughs> and of course, I tried to enlist and they turned me down. They said, no, you had blood pressure for medical reasons. You had high blood pressure and you couldn't come back in. So I wasn't able to go back in. So I stayed home for a while. Uh, it was very hard to adjust. We had no, uh, when we were left out, we were just left out, that was it. And I felt very lonely when he got off the train. And my brother uh, picked me up at the bus station. And uh, after we got, we, up, we met at the bus station after that. And he picked me up there and I came home and I just felt lost. Mm -hmm. Sometimes at night uh, when we were in Germany, that German fellow had caught our hotel on fire and did about $10,000 damage. And uh, I thought the Germans was in my room at night. I had to turn mm -hmm. my lights on. We never really had time to be afraid when we was over there. Of course, when the V1s and V2s, you were afraid of them, but mm -hmm. you, you just learned to live with them. But it was really hard to adjust. I just couldn't seem to settle down. And I would have loved to went back into service, but I just couldn't do it. But I did get a, I got a, a call, or it was a letter that was sent to me from the Pentagon. And they offered me a job in photography. Mm -hmm. So I was dating my husband, Sid. And so we went down, we visited, we went down, and I met with him. And uh, I think at the time it was a pretty nice salary. I think it was seven or eight thousand dollars they offered me. And they wanted me to come work in the lab there. Mm -hmm. But I had been stationed in Washington, D.C., and I loved Washington, D.C., but to live there, I just didn't think I'd like it. It wasn't for him and I. We planned on getting married, and uh, so I didn't take the job. How did you meet your? I, been, uh, I managed, uh, finally there was a photographer, he was chief of police and health officer in Butler, Harry Price, and uh, he uh, had called me several times and he knew I was in photography and he said he'd like to have somebody to come down to take uh, charge of his lab, photographic lab. So I finally went down and I talked with him. So uh, we were in the Wars building now on Main Street, which is going to be tore down pretty soon. But he had moved down to, I uh, worked there for a while and I had... Uh, a boy that worked under me, and uh, he worked some with it. He was health officer, though, and he would be out, or he'd be out in weddings and stuff, and would bring them back, and we would enlarge them and, and print them for them for his uh, work that he had. He did a lot of work for the police in Butler, too, for the wrecks and things like that, so we had things like that we did. So then he went into a new building down on Washington Street in Butler, and I had five girls then that I trained. Mm -hmm. I trained photography, and his sister was one of them. They lived right out here in the farm on this place here, just across from us at that time. And so he, uh, she coaxed me. She said, why don't you go with my brother? He's just back from the war. He was on the invasion. He said he went in on Juno Beach, and she said that he just don't go out much. He's very quiet. And, and she said, why don't you go with us? So I got quite attached to her, so finally she set up the date. So we went to Corn City. It was strange because that's where our boys went to school. Here in later years when we moved out here, but uh, and we went to a dance in Carn City, and we went for each other for three years, mm -hmm. and so finally you we dated went for three years. For three years, yes, because we were starting out new. We didn't have no money, and we wanted to have the things we wanted, mm -hmm. so we saved our money. And he was in a training school uh, at, uh, in Butler. He trained to be a machinist. He got a state papers, and of course he was on a training program at that time. So uh, we just saved our money and uh, worked very hard. And and uh, finally, we got married after three years. Where were you working? Where I was working? I was working for Hoppies in the uh, in the film. So I worked for him for quite a while, and then uh, we really growed. Our business was tremendous there. And finally, he had the secretary come in. He was paying her more money than I was, and I found that out. So I approached him, and I told him I thought I should be paid more money. And, and uh, he said, well, I'm not going to give it to you. And I said, well, I said, you know, I helped you start this business. And I said, you're giving her more money than I am. So I said, I'm going to give you two weeks. I'm going to leave. So in two weeks, I left. 
and Earl Groman called me, who had the drugstore, and he had a photographic shop, and he called me, and he said, Rita, he said, how would you like to come down and run my photographic? So I went down there, painted the whole thing, set it up, and did all the photo work to come in. He had tremendous business, and I worked for him until I was eight months pregnant with my uh, first child, and so then I gave the, the I gave that up. It didn't work for a while then. What was the date of your marriage? Uh, August 10th, 1949. And your children? Can you tell me about them? Yes, my oldest boy was uh, Sidney John Geibel. Um, he lives in Ohio. He has uh, one son and four girls. Um, he uh, went to Carn City, graduated in Carn City High School was on a scholarship to Wake Forest University and played football as a uh, tackle. He, when he was a sophomore at Carn City, he was 6'1", weighed 235 pounds. He, was, he went all offense and defense in the little nine leg here. When he was in Wake Forest, when he was a sophomore, they're the only team that won a championship at Wake Forest. My other boy, uh, Dennis Charles, he uh, graduated from Carn City. He uh, has, um, Went to community college and went to, um, got his bachelor's degrees in electronics. Uh, two years, uh, he had opportunities to go to Maryland and another place, but he decided to stay home here. He went into uh, Damon Industries and was studying to be a machinist, and he got his hand caught in the lathe one day, and he had two severe fingers that was damaged. And he wanted to remove his little finger, but he never allowed it. But so then, in the meantime. Uh, we started this bu building here on our property, and uh, we decided to um, start a battery shop, so that's what we did. So he owns it. Mm -hmm. Sid turned it over to him about five years ago. Uh, I worked in it for about five years mm -hmm. until it became, I wasn't able to do it anymore. But uh, I handled the books and so forth. It's sick. Sid takes care of the books for him, and he helps him on his business. The other son, Jeffrey Lee, he was uh, the youngest. I'd lost a baby between him and, and uh, I was just two months pregnant when I lost it. Jeffrey uh, was 16 when he fell from the street house and was killed instantly just above the pole here. Uh, when I was at work, I, um, I was working then out of one day's film. They were out of Pittsburgh, but I, I worked for one day's out of the fire mall. And it was a camera shop. I used to take my pictures in there, by the way, and show them to people. When people knew I had them and, uh, and they'd come in, I'd show them to them. And uh, so this one day he had called and he said to me, I used to go fishing with him on Wednesday. And uh, so uh, I told him not to forget to get some worms ready. And I said, we'll go fishing tomorrow. And uh, when I come home, I, he had, uh, the reason he had called me because he, we were to get lobster that night for supper. And uh, I, s I said I was going over to the NP. I had a meeting that night and uh, with the lab and so, uh, I said, well, as soon as I'm home, I said, then I said, uh, tomorrow we'll do that. So I came home, and he wasn't here, and Dennis was here, and so Dennis said, I'll help you get supper, Mom. And so mm -hmm. Sid wasn't feeling good because he had a tooth, and he was sitting on this chair here where his face was all swelled up. He had a big tooth, but anyways, I said to uh, Dennis, I said, where is Jeff? And he said, oh, I, he said he's probably out running. He was a football player at Carn City, too, and of course school would be starting. This happened in July. And school would be starting and uh, sometimes they never left the property the boys always stayed here they're very mm -hmm. seldom they even played on some of our properties they had a uh, softball team the men had local here and uh, they very seldom to go up here they were interested in, in things that we did here at home for them so uh, we just couldn't find them and then all of a sudden uh, I just got, got real scared and I thought there was something wrong and so uh, we looked everywhere for him, and finally uh, I said to Sid, let's us go up, there's a gas line that runs through our property, and I said, let's go up and see, maybe he's fallen and gotten hurt or something. But they very seldom never left. If they did, they would tell us where mm -hmm. they were. So uh, Dennis said, well, Mom, I'll go up on top of the hill and come down. So he come down with above our pool here, come down along the line, and all of a sudden he just left a scream at him. And uh, here he was laying dead at the bottom of the tree. He had mm -hmm. fallen about 30 feet. So they called the corner in, and they, uh, the, the coroner said it was instant death, mm -hmm. but he apparently he had his BB gun laying with him. But he, they used these trees to hunt deer, see, and uh, it was the first deer for him to hunt. But he, he was just an ordinary kid. That, and not only that, uh, he loved he loved to go fishing. And I al I always would take him. I take him at least once a week. Mm -hmm. We'd go fishing. And I, cause he didn't care for fishing, but he did. 
but the people, if it hadn't been for the people in the community, they were just marvelous. The churches all got together, and they were just grand. They, uh, we got, and uh, Sid's uh, brother that lived in California, uh, his uh, sister was, was married to Father Didius, Father Bud, we used to call him. He was out in St. Louis, so here Father Bud came home. First thing he did was come up to see us. And he said to us at the time, he said, you know, I'll be with you the whole time. And he was, and it was a marvelous thing. If it hadn't been for that, we'd have never got through it. You said the community was very supportive of you when your son passed away. Can you tell me, as far as your other activities, how the community has affected your life? Well, I've worked a lot with the communities, both my husband and I, but I, I mm -hmm. particularly worked an awful lot. I, had, uh, I didn't have no girls, but I had a, a girl softball of 100 girls. They played, uh, we, ran, we, we earned all our money. Uh, we mm -hmm. got permission from the schools, the Shakura School, to play down there. Mm -hmm. We had dances at Kern City. I had to sign papers that I'd be responsible. We had danced to raise the money for the girls. The girls would, uh, at Christmas time, we would, uh, they would get acti we would have activities where we got for the needy, for the children. Mm -hmm. I remember one night, my husband, my son, Dennis, and I, was right up north of this here. We went to this family that was very poor, and it was 18 degrees, and we didn't have a four-wheel drive then. We got our car stuck in the ice. <laughs> it was about 10 o'clock at night, and these people lived down over the hill, so we had to lug all this stuff down to their porch. They had three children. Mm -hmm. A little boy came to the door, and he was in a pair of shorts. He had no top on. His parents wasn't there, and there was a little girl coming, and I said, is your parents here? And they said, no. And I said, well, I said, you tell them. I said, but no, you're not to get in this. I said, here's some things here that was sent to you people. So uh, we packed it on the uh, porch, and then we tried to get out. We had an awful time trying to get off the ice because it was just a machine of ice. We finally did get off. We found out a few days later the mother and dad was in a bar downtown. That's where they were that night. It was another time we had a lovely family that lived uh, with a farm next that we bought to us over here. They lived down over the hill, and they were a very, very poor family, and they had about seven children. And uh, there was a friend of ours got his Jeep, and uh, I had been talking to her, and uh, I asked her what she wanted for Christmas, and she said she would like to have a slip, an underslip, you know. Mm -hmm. So we bought her another slip, and we, got s we had some fruit and toys for the children. Mm -hmm. And so we went down. The father wasn't there, but he, there was another problem where he happened to be an alcoholic. But they had been married when they were very, very young. She was from 15. They came from West Virginia, and she was a lovely person. And she was so thrilled that we came there that night. And you know, they didn't even have, they had uh, boxes from the stores where they settle on, and they had a, a makeshift uh, huh. table. But you know, those children never forgot what we did for them because they often mention it as they were older. They moved to a high, they got back with their father again, and I never heard from them after that. Can you tell me about your veterans' activities? Well, we're very active in, I belong to uh, the 7th and 8th photo group. I belong to the 8th Air Force Historical Society, which is nationwide. I belong to the Western and Eastern Division of 8th Air Force. Uh, I belong, we are the first husband and wife to join the American Legion. I am the first woman commander of the American Legion, which was in 92 and 93. Uh, we were having problems with our Legion where they only had three members. They had approached Sid and I and asked if we would uh, be active in it, so we did. We got a group together, a wonderful group together. Uh, we have now one of the most active American Legions in the state, in the county here. Uh, we went way over our quota this year. We got a citation for it. My husband is the adjutant this year. Uh, I was offered, now for the coming year, to take for the hist historian and also or else the chaplain, but I refused because I will help, but I'm, I'm not going to take office because it's just too much for me. We did start a museum down here when we uh, have started it. Uh, we have a little about 1,300 in it. We have, uh, my husband now has applied to the Butler County to ask for some uh, finances that may help us to continue this. Mm -hmm. I have uh, copies of uh, my pictures of a duck cow down there. I have some other copies. We have some things we donated. We donated, the government gave us about 11 big pictures. We put them in frames and donated the frames for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but the county now 
has sent us a letter back, and if we meet that criteria, they're going to uh, maybe next year they'll give us a grant that we made to complete this. We hope they do. Um, our legion, they want, they would like to build a, another building now because they are going to the point that when we have the county meeting come out, we just don't have enough room for the people. Mm -hmm. We put on dinners. When I was commander, I started with the schools. I had a, a teacher, Sam Swift from Shakur School, called me one day. Well, see, one time we was at the football field and we had a uh, uh, honor. We always have the honor, you know, with the firing of the guns in honor of the veterans. And some of the kids up in the stand uh, made a remark, some of the boys out, oh, look, they may be shooting deer, which sure is deer over around there. Well, you know, we felt very bad. So Mr. Swick knew this. He, he did the announcing, and he felt terrible. He had been a friend of ours for years, and mm -hmm. uh, he taught the sixth grade. He's now retired from that. So he called me on the phone, and he said, you know, Miss Scott, we said, I, I want you to do something for me. He said, what? He said, why don't you come into the schools, mm -hmm. your veterans, all your veterans, come into the schools and have programs? So we did. So we go in every year now, and we have programs. We have programs at, uh, during the winter, usually around October, at the football game. And uh, if I'm well enough and my husband there, we go with the Honor Guard. We also go to all the funerals. Anybody wants funerals, our legion does not charge, but we go to the Honor Guards. And that we, have, we have a program there that we have. We have all the veterans mm -hmm. that we have. And a lot of us are getting very old. We hope that the younger people will come in and do this now. But anyways, uh, I started, uh, I would have on Veterans Day, we would have a dinner. <laughs> we would, uh, we don't pray here, we pray, we prayed in Memorial, this Memorial Day coming, we're having a parade, and uh, well then we have a dinner, the VFW set that up, but the county helps us with some money for the dinner we have for that. But um, the, uh, I had, and then we would have our birthday, with 75th birthday, the district commander came out, and we had a big cake. I was commander at that time, and of course, uh, it was in the state legion paper, by the way, mm -hmm. in the state of Pennsylvania. They had showed it cutting their cake. We started that. Another thing we started, we have about four nursing homes in this area. We have one home up in Collinsville that are homeless veterans. Uh, they, I understand the government does pay t uh, tax on that place up there. And we have a program for them in mm -hmm. Christmas. Uh, it pays at Memorial Day. They, some of the fellows come down. They all parade in a group. Mm -hmm. They parade, and uh, they uh, they stay there. But we we have this program, and then we take we fix baskets of fruits, and the, the, of our own money we fix up nice gifts and stuff like that. We take to them. We go around to the nursing homes, to the four nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we visit any veteran that is in there. And uh, I think last year there was something over 200 was in that within those nursing homes. So we do, that's a particular thing we do. Uh, I have to stop to think a minute. What else? Is the Veterans Association doing enough for the aging veterans? Yeah, I, th I, th I think more so now than they did. I think after we reached this 50th anniversary, it seems to mm -hmm. be that they're doing more. The, the uh, different ones, they have different programs that they've mm -hmm. set up. A lot of them go out to the VA. We go out to the VA, too. Now, they will send us notice. We will uh, go out and have bingo, which we uh, spend an mm -hmm. evening, and uh, they get a, uh, well, we get a certificate now they can take to the, uh, go and cash it in down mm -hmm. there. And uh, that's very nice, but th there's, there's, we'll volunteer whoever wants to go, and we go out there and we spend time with them. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, as far as, uh, uh, I, I, there's, there's, there's just, there's a tremendous amount of people even go in and visit. They, mm -hmm. I know when I was a patient out at the VA, they visited me. The Knights of Columbus visited me, and some of the uh, different uh, personnel from Butler County would come in and talk with us, which was very nice, too. And they would bring us maybe a little gift or something. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Can you tell us what you're wearing? Tell us a little bit about what you're wearing. The 8th Air Force? That's the 8th Air Force. That Andy. is our logo, yeah. That is, the when, the when the Air Force was Army Air Force, we didn't have the 8 in it. It was just wings. And then the 8th Air Force is what we got was they established it as the Eighth Air Force. It started Eighth Air Force started down in Savannah, Georgia, and uh, we were a reunion down there a number of years ago. And I was in the American Legion where the mm -hmm. first meeting was ever held of the Army Air Force at that time. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about today that you would like to tell us? I don't know. <laughs> 
Okay. I'd like to thank you very much, and we're going to go on and just show a little bit of your m museum, if you will, uh, and describe that. So I'll cut there. Thank you. Rita, you want to introduce your husband to us? This is my husband, Sylvester Jake Geibel. We call him Sid. How long have you been married? We've been married for, uh, what is it, 48, on August 10th, we'll be married 48 years. And what was the best thing about Sid? Uh, when I first met him, he was very quiet, and he uh, didn't go out very much, and he didn't look very good. And his sister asked me if I would go to a blind date with him because she wanted to meet somebody, and we had a lot in common both then in the service. Sid, what was it like to be married to Rita? Oh, it was awful. I shouldn't kid. <laughs> no, 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 no. All kidding aside. No, it's been great. It's been a wonderful life. We've had a very good uh, relationship, I believe you'd call it. And tell me what you do when she goes out to speak to some schools. I go along and carry the uh, material. Why is he important? No, I, I do help her so, uh, that way, and also once in a while I get uh, a word in edgeways now and then too. Tell me why you think it's important. Uh, the trouble with the world today, uh, the books on World War II and some of the atrocities and stuff that went on then have amount to about two paragraphs in a book. They're not, uh, the kids, the young people today don't know anything about it. They don't even know who was there, what was there, what the reason was, or what it was for. Do you want to tell us anything else? I talk too much. Okay. Thank you both very much. Camera, we were so shocked, I don't think we'd ever used it. Really. Yes, okay. This is Dachau, which is uh, 10 miles north of Munich. I visited here in uh, May of 1945, I had a Polish uh, gentleman take us through Dachau. Uh, here are the guns that was used up on the, where the Germans would shoot them if they tried to escape. These are some of the uh, prisoners that was held there. The fight against fascism is still upon us. This shows the how they marked their arms. They had a serial number they would put on them. This shows the camp here. This is bodies that was piled in here. Here's the bones of the people that were put to death here. This shows a big pile of bones here, of the bodies that were put to death here. I think it's the same picture. This where they hung it. They hung from here. They also hang, hang from a tree, and they were shot or uh, hung. This is another with the bones there. These were the furnaces where the bones was in the furnace was when we went over there. These were the wagons. There was over a uh, hundred wagons at that cow when they started to clean it up. What was on the bodies, on the wagons? What was what? What was on the wagons? Those were bodies on the wagons there. There were, uh, at this, this particular time, there was uh, uh, even some that were brought in at that cow on the railroads and there was a bomb hit the railroad at that time and uh, some of them were severely damaged and they just left the bodies lay there. This is a close up. Here's the bodies here. Shows. And down here. This is a pile of bodies here. The stench was terrible. The smell was awful. It would make you sick at your stomach. That's about it.
you want it if the uh, right. this is a Rita M. Strobel Geibel. I was with the 325th Reconnaissance Photo Lab with 8th Air Force, 8th Air Force Command at High Wycombe, uh, England. The scarf, which is a yellow scarf. I, I also wore yellow gloves and our overseas hat was trimmed with a yellow band. When I met the Queen of England, so an honor guard for the King and Queen, uh, we wore these scarves and uh, gloves. This is a group. This is part of the group of the uh, photo lab, the 325th Reconnaissance 8th Air Force Command. Uh, from my left is Rita Geibel setting. Standing is uh, Sergeant Daniels, who is now deceased. In the middle in the back is Betty Lohler, who is deceased in 1958. Uh, the girl with a tie on is Betty Deckard Wolford from Strutters, Ohio. She's still living. Beside her is uh, Betty Cushing Cheater, who is from Massachusetts. She is deceased, and the girl sitting is. Uh, my mind's going blank. I can't think of her name, isn't that terrible? Uh, she's also deceased. She died just this. Uh, Helen Swartz was her name. She was from. Uh, uh, Wisconsin. And the girl in the middle is uh, Sergeant uh, Helen or Sergeant Parker. She married uh, a Cornstrom and her husband's dead, but she's still living. These were part of the 13 girls that were stationed with around two to 300 men with the photo tech. What is this? This is us in Germany. This is me. Okay. All right, and uh, now mm. okay. All right, this was taken in uh, Bad Kissinger, Germany, where we were stay at the Bad Kissinghof Hotel. We had a beautiful hotel. We stayed there. We was with a 13 photo tech after the war was over. This is uh, me on the right, Rita. M. Strobel Geibel, uh, Betty Decker, Wolford is from uh, Ohio, Strutters, Ohio. The other two girls, I forget their name, I don't know them. But they were with Ninth Air Force. They were not with the photo lab, but they were with Ninth Air Force with us. All right, this is the Eighth Air Force operation. It is uh, the stats from 1942 to 1945. There's only three books, to my knowledge, that are in existence. These uh, pages, there's 72 pages here. It gives all the stats of 8th Air Force from 1942 to 45. There's 72 pages. One book is with General Doolittle's Museum in California. The other girl uh, from California has the other. She was the one that took it off the uh, teletype when these uh, stats came in. She made it into a book, and after we were in our reunion in, in uh, Georgia, our 45th reunion, I had used a lot of my photographs to f put a book for us, so she called me on the phone, talked to me for about an hour, and said, I have a book that I think you would like to have. Uh, she made me up a book like that. I have been offered any price I want for it. I don't give no copies off it because there's not very much in existence. It takes care of all the bombs. Uh, how much bombs are dropped, it takes their medals, it just, it's, it's a marvelous book, it just has everything in it. All the different outfits that they were. Generally? All right, this is uh, an honor guard, I stood honor guard, Rita M. Geibel, for General Doolittle and uh, uh, the King of England, King and Queen of England. Uh, about 70 of us people stood honor guard. There was quite a few girls that stood in the line here for honor guard. When the queen came to me, she stopped. She asked me my name. She asked me where I was from. I told her I was from Butler, Pennsylvania, where it was near Pittsburgh. She said she was familiar with Pittsburgh. 
she asked me what kind of work I was doing. I told her I worked in the 325th photo reconnaissance. We did aerial photographs, developing and printing. She thanked us for being here and helping us win the war. After that, BBC's had notified me and asked me if I'd like to go in and talk on BBC's. I did not go because I'd got word my brother was killed, so I left somebody else go in my place. This shows the formation of the uh, veterans that were there. The, they are veterans now, that the ones that stood on her guard for her. General Dula was knighted in the Knights of Bath of the Royal English Army at this particular time. Okay. All right, this is where we developed the uh, aerial photographs, reconnaissance, we'd bring back their film. The film would be in canisters. They would be about uh, 200 uh, feet of film. They were nine and a half wide. We had to go in a complete dark room in the back where these machines are. We had to process this film in complete darkness. One of our first assignments was to roll this film, which we had never seen, never seen this machine. We went back in. We uh, had in complete dark. We had to load it. We had to put it, go through the chemicals, through the developer, and through the uh, hyper, and through the fixer. And then it came out on a conveyor belt. It uh, came into, after the conveyor belt, it came down into a water, which was a rinse and had alcohol in it. One time it caught on fire, and uh, we could have been burnt to death. There was no other exit there. And it, uh, this is how the, print, the films were developed. Uh, this here's part of, uh, wait a minute. This is part of the V for victory. On the right would be 8th Air Force Phototech. On the left was the 2nd Phototech, which was at 8th Air Force Command. The 8 is the girls. I was in the girl center that made the 8th at that. That was a V uh, victory bond drive. This here is the V8, where it shows that we stood on this and made this V for victory with the 8, and that was for the bond drive. I won a $25 award bond at that time. And uh, I don't know what ever happened to it, but I don't have it today. With a nice shoe box. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is some of uh, Glenn Miller. I don't know what they called them, whether the Ink Spots or something like that. The four singers. They were part of Glenn Miller's band. He played for us. Uh, we were the last to hear his band. I have pictures in my album of his whole band. But he went with Small Plane with his coach. Uh, he went over, was going to France to put on a show. And his plane disappeared, and their research through the uh, Historical Society and the 7th and 8th Photo Group, we found out that the English had dropped their bombs on their way back from a mission, and they believed that the bomb hit their plane, and that's what happened to him. It was a very foggy night whenever he flew there. This is a crowd that we have. I, I'm in there somewhere along the sitting in there somewhere with the rest of the group. This is a show that uh, they, he put on for us. Go ahead. All right, this is, uh, on the right is, is uh, Captain Euling, Catherine Euling. Uh, she was Captain Young. She was our CO. She greeted uh, Queen Elizabeth. And the uh, Duchess of Kent, I believe, was with her that day, too. And this is where the Queen is talking to me. I was pleased. I, I, when they, I had asked what I would answer when I talked to her, and they said, every time you say something to her, you say ma'am. So I would have to say ma'am, like my name, ma'am, and where it's from, and I'd say ma'am. And so she, she was very gracious, very beautiful. She had a uh, gloves that grew up on her arm, nice, beautiful hat. And... Uh, I was really proud. Everybody said after that, can I touch you? Okay. This. It's hard to see where we were. Look on the monitor. Yeah, but I can't see that. Okay, but the arrow is already pointing to okay. you, so it's okay. All right. You ready? Mm -hmm. This is the arrow pointing down to where I was. 
Uh, the five of us that spent a lot of time together are in, the, in this photo here. We were from the photo lab tech. This is with the rest of the men were with ours with the 8th Air photo, photo Tech, 8th Air Force Command. Okay, go ahead. All right, this is Rita Strobel Geibel. I had uh, just come back from flying all over the war zone in a B 17. I was sick from the air from flying. It was a six hour trip. I had my uh, a parachute on and uh, I posed for this picture. I look like a real casualty of World War II. Okay. Okay, we're rolling. All right, these. It's my job as a photo lab technician. I developed these photographs. These are taken from the reconnaissance planes that were flown to us. We developed them. And this was, they would go out on the missions all over uh, Germany and what the installation they wanted to knock out in order to, uh, so our troops could move in and, and that we could stop the aggressive war. We developed these uh, around the clock, 24 hours sometimes. We worked 10, 12 hours in the lab, unheated building. Uh, they were, uh, it just, the different, I can't distinguish which ones mm -hmm. they are. This is Sherberg here, uh, and the landing in Sherberg, if you get up close, you'll see where the boats have overturned. I have Normandy in here with, uh, uh, this is Sherberg here. This is, this is Sherberg, part of Sherberg there, yeah. This shows some more. This was uh, Brennan. Brennan, shows the damage. Uh, this is concentration camp. This is where our prisoners were held in the concentration camp. It's an aerial view of it. These are gliders which brought in supplies to us in the photo lab. This is Frankfurt there. These were smaller. These were five by seven and they were all marked what they were rest area. I didn't particularly care working on these because you didn't get to see much. I like the other ones. This here shows a mission of the 8th Air Force on their mission dropping their bombs. This was the P-38. Uh, the tail twins. I don't know what this one was here. These are our planes for 8th Air Force. This is a Falk Wolf, uh, World War II English. The mosquito there. These are the planes. This is a V-1 rocket. It's one of the few they said that was uh, actually filmed. Sometimes the English and they were able to shoot down these planes when they come uh, came over, but this is one that they actually did, got a photograph of it. This is Rhine making bridge, the Battle of the Bulge, where a lot of our uh, uh, People, veterans or soldiers were killed. Uh, this was a very famous battle. It was toward the end of the war, which was uh, almost the ending of, of World War II. I don't know. This is a marshaling yard outside of Munich. Uh, we call them railroad yards here. They called them marshaling yards there. This is a German M uh, jet, one of the first jets they had, this upper picture here. This is a flight. Uh, the 8th Air Force flew in formation. When the English flew their planes, they didn't fly in formation, and sometimes the uh, Germans would follow them through and come on the fields and strafe the fields when they come back. This they didn't do. As I understand, we were not strafed with them during World War II. We may have been at one time, but they always said with our formation, it didn't happen as much. This is a, um, a uh, hero, Eric Hartman. Uh, he had tremendous amount of missions. In fact, when his plane crashed here, he survived it. He lived here until a few years ago. This ME-109 German plane. May 7, 1945. That would be just a bit this is the cathedral at Cologne. There was a little bit, or in Paris, a little bit of that was uh, bombed out a little. There was a little bit of bombed in that. This is a field where the uh, Eighth Air Force had some of the bombs on the field sitting. Okay. 
London Bridge has fallen down. It so shows that strafe in there, the sugar dog they call that. That's some of our planes on formation there. This is one of the divisions. This is White Cliffs and Over. This is a convoy here. This is a convoy of ships, the way they transported our troops overseas. Another at the bomb group shows the bombs where they load up. I don't know what, I was told here this was some kind of Stuttgart in Munich. Somebody told me about this. I never found out till recently somebody was talking and he told me that's what that was. Here's your just uh, some more of the pictures. Shows a lot of tremendous, a lot of damage. Unbelievable how they must have suffered. Yes. These, yeah. are, these are the medals that I receive for my service. I received five medals and two foreign medals. Now, on our discharge paper, they just keep track of the American medals. The foreign medals are not listed on your uh, discharge. We received the foreign medals in 1946. We had already gone to Germany, and so they uh, are uh, eight photo tech and seven photo dirt did a research in this and found out that we had been issued this from the Allies from the. Uh, it called, they call it the American Order of the French Curtis Girl, which is the highest award the France gave out. The Belgium Freedom was also a medal was given to us for the work that we sent there. Uh, I have to read this. It's in left to right is the European American Middle Eastern Campaign, the American Theater of Operation Medal, the Good Conduct Medal, the Medal de la France, Liberated. Belgium Freedom, and the French Cœur de Gore. And I must have left one out of here. Vic Victory Medal and the Palos Athena Medal, which was given. The Green Medal, which is uh, here, is was given to the women that served, the Women's Army Corps. All right, this is a, a photographic book that was made with a photographic paper for the 325th Reconnaissance Wings Base Laboratory. The P-38 here, it shows and it gives the stats of what was done with our photographic lab. This is Brigadier General Roosevelt, Elmer, er, Elliot Roosevelt, President Roosevelt's son. He was command of the lab. This is where our work went. We went to the 8th Air Force, to the heavy bomb groups, the 325th Crater 7th Photo Group, the 22nd Bomb Group, the 9th. Uh, it broke down into the film, which was all flown through the 325th, and a very important thing was made here. We made history. In the model printer section, uh, we printed over 2 million prints a month which is one of the highest productions at any time was ever turned out in any photographic lab. We did duplicate negatives, we did uh, transparents, vector graph, bomb plots, target plots, uh, hexagon photos. Uh, it went out to all the different groups, Eustacia, Air Force, Shaft, USA, and Ninth Air Force. This shows the craters. These are some of the pictures that were put in here and tells the stats about that. This is a film section where they developed the film, processed the film. In here, too, it shows some of the guys that's working there. This is contact printing, where everything was done with contact printing. Sometimes it would be as high as 20 by 24 and even larger than that. This was a finishing section here where they finished, uh, the, they were washed and uh, dried. Mosaic, where if you'd put these together, these films, they would have a map of the country of where it was or where it was taken. This is your supply section where all our supplies were stored, where they're brought to us. This here is the uh, chemical mix. It tells you all the chemicals and how the big vats that they had. These would be piped into our machine. We would test our chemicals when we were there. When we needed, all we had to do was turn on a... a, 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 a thing that would, the chemicals would be brought in. This is utility here, and this is a Victor graph. It shows me here. I was the only girl that worked in this. I did the developing of it. This is a finished print, which you would look through dark glasses to see the three dimension. We did this, they said, in case of World War III, 
the Mediterranean. I had one in my collection that I sent through sensors, but when I got it at home, it disappeared. Somebody had taken it out, and I wasn't able to have another one. This is our officers of the uh, 325th photo group. This was the uh, second photo group, and this was your officers of the eighth photo group. This is our second photo group, and this is their eighth. And down here with these girls, five of us here. There were 13 total of us in the photo lab who worked in different departments. And these were the hallways. These were the target missions in the hallways. They were a very, very large building, an unheated building. We had no heat. We used to wear overcoats. It smelled terrible of chemicals. But we got our work done, and we had one of the largest photographic set, set up in World War II. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>